Hi. Uh, in this initial slide to kick off this section on achieving service value, I want to share some sort of big picture thoughts with you. First of all, uh, we're sitting, let me get my little highlighter pen here working. We're, uh, as I'm doing this, this tape, I'm, it's the middle of June 2012. And as you read business uh, literature like I do, you see a lot of random surveys on how pumped up employees are working wherever they are. And the surveys are uniformly dismal across the country and even really around the globe. Uh, certainly employee engagement is kind of an all-time high. I saw one the other day where one-third of all employees that had surveyed said they'd quit their current jobs if they could. The problem is they don't have a next best alternative job opportunity. And of course, this lack of, of, of engagement or, or dismal morale is understandable in the context of, of the global meltdown we've been going through over the last few years. If you go back to third quarter 2008, when we had a, a, a really a global financial system cardiac arrest, uh, that was like a shotgun start that really gave cover as well as necessity to uh, all businesses to say, you know what, we got to start slashing the payroll. So people were let go for the first time in you know modern history. Uh, wages were actually cut back. A lot of times people just freeze them and then let inflation eat away. But wages were cut back and every benefit across the board was cut back. And then it's stayed there. Freezes, no raises. Um, if there are any increases in benefit costs, those are passed on to the to the uh, to the employee. So the flip side of that is businesses are saying, you know, hey, profits are pretty good. You know, the uh, government's been borrowing and spending and trying to stimulate the economy if, at in, zero interest rates. Nobody's feeling like they're going to go bankrupt. So. Um, Things are looking pretty good from a, a profitability viewpoint. But going forward, if we said to all of our employees, hey, we'd like you to uh, put a little extra effort, invest in yourself and in the company and you know get re-educated to do individual mastery or you're a part of a service process team that we want to improve and upgrade that capability so that company-wide or service value proposition is going to get better, et cetera. And we're going to pursue nicheonomics, as we've talked about in previous uh, video clips. The people are going to go like, what's in it for me? And not have much hope. So that gets me to the, to the second point here in this slide, which is sort of a focal question, which is how do we induce, that means create an environment that 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 has the employee spontaneous work from within turn on get enthusiastic and say yeah not only do i want to be part of it but i'll work with other people to make things happen and i can work with people to make things happen because I, I i can see the mountain i can see where we're trying to go and with the team we'll muddle our way there because we can all see it and and not only can we see it we believe it so what we can conceive and believe then potentially we can achieve so that's the focal question. Now, I've, I've put here a couple of big key assumptions, which we sort of need to name and claim and, and, and test and see if they're true. My first assumption right here, number one, is that basically all human beings want to do a good job. I mean, you know, if I'm here, I might as well, you know, do whatever I'm doing well, uh, although I don't necessarily have a definition of what good or great is in a strategic context. Like I do generic service standards. Well, the fact that that's not brilliant for a given niche, I didn't know that and I didn't know that mattered. But if I did, maybe I could tune or be more agile or flexible as far as delivering that. Um, and certainly uh, I'd want to work you know, be it, everybody wants to be a team member right here as far as working together. That's what we are. We're herd, herd animals, clans. We get together. We, we, that's how we survive. We, we collaborate. But it's still the, the, the underlying issue is, but, you know, here at this corporation, what's in it for me? I mean, you know, fine, the shareholders are doing well and profits are up. It's nice to read. And we all read about the top 1% super rich guys that are really causing our problems. It's political, uh, you know, uh, propaganda, but that's out there and people want to believe it. Second big assumption is that when we go to do something in our business and say, here's where we want to go and here's how we're going to do it, it's not like everybody says, wait a minute, I, I have my own opinions of what might work best in my environment, especially for me. So people like to be in control and they like to individualize what goes on in their space. Uh, some classic examples are IBM historically had this 
very strict internal culture, which included dress code and what kind of you had to wear a white shirt and all that sort of stuff. And finally, when they got in early tr big troubles in the early 90s and they were getting really in a, in, a, in a bind for finding new software engineers, they just said, you know what, we have to junk the dress code. And we can let we can't even make sure everybody shows up and works in Dilbertville in their cubicle. We just have to say because the competition has done this. Look, you know our dress code is you have to wear clothes, um, nothing provocative, uh, and then you can work from wherever you want. So if you want to telecommute, etc., that's fine. The key thing is just get the job done to quality specs on time. In other words, let's just let's focus on the big stuff, on t you know perfect you know excellence on time you know kind of stuff. Another sort of interesting story is that zoos over the last, you know, 60 years have found that the more space they can give to big animals and the more that space resembles their natural habitat, the more energetic and active the animals are, which makes good viewing for the spectators that come and see that. So a question we might ask is how much space, uh, uh, discretionary uh, uh, choices can we give to our employees without having chaos or anarchy? How do we expand the, the boundaries of, of the cage, if you will, of, of all of our employees so they're more animated and so forth? Uh, third assumption is if I come through periodically as a, as a boss supervisor kind of person and say, how's everything going? Hey, people have no problem looking busy, sucking up, telling me whatever I want to hear. It's informational obeisance. You know, it's, it's the emperor's clothes. And, and, and we all sense it, you know, from an executive viewpoint. Um, but if I leave and, you know, a team of people are working in the warehouse or inside sales or uh, the back office uh, area where they all have to fill in for each other and so forth, you can't fool your peers for longer than about three hours or a day. So if we want collective support, but also collective discipline, then it's very important to put everybody on a peer team and have metrics for that tier peer team that also are tied into the bottom line. So there's a clear line of sight between what are we doing right now and how does that improve profits and what's in that for me? In other words, there's got to be some sort of gain sharing payoff that's concrete, measurable, visible, and I can believe in. Otherwise, why bother? Well, if we can do that, then the team, like a like a like a, a, a V-shaped uh, wedge of, of uh, geese, can you know honk away and keep each other organized and and and, and strict formation going at 80 miles an hour. Uh, the fourth assumption is that if we can be clear on the big stuff, and it has to be the right stuff. In other words, if we don't have a focused nicheonomic strategy in a service value equation, we just have generic service. We have generic, you know, we get last look and meet the price. We've been through this. But if we have a new tuned vision, stakeholder symmetry, everybody want to grow premium wealth for every stakeholder. Our mission is to be the, 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 the best total service value proposition in a given niche. And then you add your own values, respect for individual stuff like that. Then we can let the, 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 t the teams worry about all the small stuff, which they're going to love to, and they're going to do it very energetically. And then my last assumption is that when we start to try to get the boat moving in a certain direction, say, okay, everybody get your oar in the water and start rowing away, and, and the boat's going to get momentum and direction, and then we're all going to you know, do better off because of it, people don't realize all the little tugs and, and, and efforts that lots of other rowers potentially could be making at that location, at the whole company, so forth. So we have to make all these little small progress steps and wins visible to everybody. So we have to publish what I call praising statements. So we'll get into a, a lot of that in this section. So those are the overall thoughts I have about the, the big challenge of we've got to re-engage our employees to make the service value uh, story happen. Thank you.